Yeah. Okay. Sorry, it's, uh, yeah. So, welcome everyone, and um, really do appreciate the commitment. And uh, we we have asked for people to stay late at the office today to use that pre-COVID notion. So it, it, it is very much appreciated. And um, it is interesting that whilst COVID and lockdown have drawn attention to the importance of physical and mental well-being, it's it's something that has always been important, but often neglected. So it gives me real pleasure today to introduce Celine. Celine Morin, uh, she's somebody who specialises in providing practical, accessible advice on how we can all look after ourselves better. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Celine for what promises to be an extremely valuable investment of our own time in ourselves. So over to you, Celine, and everybody. Hopefully you find it very useful and enjoyable. Celine? Thank you. Thank you. And hello. Hi, everyone. I appreciate that it's a very warm end of the day in the middle of a week, in the middle of a long year, it seems. And what a good time to have a conversation around resilience and well-being and our performance, knowing that we're coming up to the midpoint of this year. And uh, so many people are expressing how they're feeling tired, but wired, almost jaded, and it's exhausting. So my objective is by the end of our session today that you have at least one thing, one practical thing that you can take into your personal circumstances, no matter how you find yourself, that can potentially help you to sustain better energy, to maybe uplift your well-being, uh, so that you can go into the second half of 2021, perhaps feeling a lot better than you did coming into the beginning of the year. Because we don't know what's coming at us. We know that there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of stress, we know we're near the end. This is possibly just the end of chapter one. And so there's a lot we can't change. But what we can potentially change is how we look after ourselves. And when we do that, we're potentially able to not only help us, but help this community of colleagues and those that we really care about and then our greater communities. So because there's a privilege at being a speaker, you're going to get to know about me. Um, before I officially start sharing slides and and launch into the presentation. I'd love to know as a quick check in. If you were to use one word to describe how you're feeling in this moment, and there's no right or wrong answer here, there just is awareness. What would that word be? And if you're happy to share that in the chat, I'd be curious to know how you're feeling. So what, what word would you use to describe how you're feeling? And I'm going to keep an eye on the chat in this moment. Thank you, Adrian. Rushed, hot, relaxed, tired, tired. Busy, all right, tired, tired, hot, warm, yeah. Okay, there seems to be a trend here <laughs> around uh, fatigue and heat. And heat doesn't help with fatigue, right? I mean, I'm currently in my office, which is in a loft, and there's just no airflow. It's really, really warm. Okay, so this is one of the first practical tools that I'm going to share with you is ah thank you you're looking forward to what you're doing later great great is what i call um awareness so to ask yourself how am i and you can ask yourself how you are mentally or emotionally or physically like some of us immediately said we're hot so that refers to this physical body some of you said tired that could be emotionally or mentally tired um but asking how you are is important because we can't consciously change what we're not conscious of in the first place and now that you've maybe really expressed that you're feeling tired you could maybe make a decision you to change that if you want to you could maybe stand and stretch while i'm chatting because that could help energize you or you could grab a glass of cold water so starting with the question how am i is an important step towards moving towards how i would like to potentially be right perhaps i'm going to share slides and i never want to assume that uh, everybody can see a slide. Can I have maybe a thumbs up from Adrian if you can see performance chemistry? Okay, great, great. So the topic for today is around well-being, yes, but ultimately it's about knowing how to manage our internal chemistry for the better so that we can optimize and feel good. So I've come prepared. I've got, so to speak, a menu. However, I don't want you to leave with indigestion and take too much back with you. So before we wrap up, I'm going to ask you to pledge one thing to yourself that you're going to do differently or think about doing more of 
in return for your time and energy in being here. I will also share a thank you note. Uh, so you're welcome to be in touch with me if you'd like to, to if, if you have any personal questions, if something comes up that we haven't answered today, uh, you can find me on various social media links or find my email address when you get the thank you note. Because well-being is a vast topic, right? Uh, and it's an incredibly important, relevant topic, especially considering where we find ourselves. So I know that through my own lessons, my own experience of um, coming really close to burnout at the end of last year and helping hundreds and thousands of others, it's such a privilege to be able to do this work, is that even when things are not going great, we can learn a lot. In fact, we need to be able to uh, hold negative emotion in order to really fully live into positive emotion. And right now at the moment, we are experiencing what feels like an invincible summer. And we don't know what the winter's going to bring, right? So let's take a look at how we can make sure that your performance, resilience, well-being toolkit has got some extra tools in it. So no matter what gets thrown at us, potentially you're able to respond better. And I'd like to start with another, well, not, I'd, I'd, I'd like to build on a practical exercise. So I'm going to set my timer for one minute. I'll let you know when we start and when we finish. And what I invite you to do is to bring your awareness to your chest, to your breath, and to count how many breath cycles you take in the next 60 seconds. An inhale and an exhale is one breath cycle. Um, and ideally, I'd like you not to change your breath. You may change it simply now because you're aware of it. But I invite you to notice your breath and over the next 60 seconds, to count how many breath cycles you take. And I'll explain why this is important and how you can use this. So starting in five, four, three, two, one. Bring your awareness to your chest and notice your breath and count how many breath cycles you take over the next 60 seconds. And if your mind has wandered, without judgment or criticism, gently bring it back, perhaps back to your breath. And there we go, that's one minute. It's interesting to notice how you felt, because for some of us, you might have felt like that was really long and it made you feel uncomfortable. Or you could have felt like, oh my goodness, can she just like let us sit here a bit longer? And all of that is really good awareness. So if you're happy to share in the chat, how many breath cycles did you take in that minute? I actually forgot to count my own. I usually try and do that. <laughs> all right, so 12, 15, five. That's the lowest I've had in probably forever. 20, 35, 23, they're coming in fast and furiously. Great. Ah, 10, felt like too many. That's good awareness. Lost count, that's okay. All right, so there's mostly double digits. Uh, it's coming a bit quickly for me to do an average and I'm not great at numbers. So whatever your breath cycle is, the guideline is to take slower, deeper breaths if we want to reduce the sense of hyperarousal and the fight or flight response that all of us are in. It's not, are we stressed? It's how are we impacted by the stress? So the breath is one of the first places that we can notice the stress response in us because most of us will constrict our shoulders, maybe I clench my jaws, we'll start to take faster, shallower breaths. So it's an indication of potentially the fact that you could be stressed and it's a valuable tool to help you come out of that fight or flight response and move more towards what we call the rest and digest nervous system, which is really valuable if you want to be able to manage your energy and performance and resilience. So a lot of the research is showing that somewhere between six to eight breath cycles per minute is ideal. Understanding that if you were taking 20 breath cycles or higher, you can't go down to eight because you might pass out. But it's good awareness that actually I could be really breathing really shallow 
So I'm going to come back to the breath a little bit later, but between now and then, as long as you consciously keep it in mind, perhaps breathe a little bit deeper into your belly and lengthen your exhale, even if it is by one or two seconds longer as we spend this time together. So maybe this can feel like a bit of a spa for your nervous system. When we speak about well-being, there's various different dimensions. So when I asked you for a check-in, like how would you describe your well-being? Some of you, as I mentioned, refer to your body, your physical well-being, being hot or uh, sweaty or tired. Uh, we also have our emotional well-being, which relates to our ability to know our emotions, to regulate them, the quality of our relationships, to be able to manage stress. And then our mind or our intellectual well-being is about this this four pound universe that sits on our shoulders. So the ability to concentrate, even if we are stressed, to keep big picture thinking, to problem solve, uh, really important for the work that you do, right? And then we also have our sense of hope or meaning or spirit, which is our, uh, our ability to feel as if we're part of something bigger. Perhaps it's about leaving a legacy or contributing. For some people, it is related to a faith. I like to refer to it more as my sense of hope and purpose. And for today's presentation, we're going to focus primarily on the dimension of physical well-being. So that relates to the actions that you take to support your lifestyle and your body and the way that you eat and the way that you move and the way that you breathe and the way that you sleep. Because when you optimize those fundamentals, you're then able to show up at your best emotionally and mentally and then have additional potential resources for finding meaning. Um, so to to see whether you're doing the fundamentals, I'm going to take us through a framework that will give you a score. And perhaps before we get an objective score, what is your, your subjective score to that question? If you were to give yourself a rating out of 10 on the spot, as knowing that there's no right or wrong, what would it be out of 10? And if you want to share that, you can. If not, I'd like you just to hold that for yourself. And let's compare what your subjective rating out of 10 is to the score that you're going to have when we wrap up the session. So the, the, the assessment that I'm going to take you through is the Wellculator. After I qualified as a dietitian in 2000 and then did six years of clinical practice, and after specializing in diabetes and heart disease and hypertension, I realized actually if I worked in the workplace and was more proactive, potentially we could change people's lives before they got diagnosed with those conditions. Uh, so then I started doing workplace well-being, and here we are very different workplace well-being in the zoom so to speak um, and the wellculator is a tool that i've been using since then it's science-backed but it's simplified because in my experience we don't need more complexity and often we don't need more information we just need more time with the same information and the ability to integrate it so i'm going to go through 10 areas quite quickly if you would like to delve into any of the areas deeper you're welcome to be in touch with me and I've got resources that I can share with you or maybe point you in a certain direction. Um, and we're also going to have the chance to check in with one another. So there'll be a follow up check in session where those of you that would like to, you can come back and share and celebrate uh, what's gone right with your personal pledge. Or maybe there's been challenges and then we can help one another that way. So the first point on the Wellculator relates to your strategy around the way that you feed yourself. So have you got a refueling strategy that sustains your energy levels? So most of the time, not 100% of the time, but 80% of the time, do you eat in a way that helps you stay energized and well? I generally come across this, you know, we're waking up in the mornings and it's morning mayhem for whatever reason. We may be really tired because, you know, we've been awake between 2 and 4 a.m. We end up grabbing a cup of coffee, making it on time to our first times to, to our first teams meeting. Uh, and, and it's crazy all day long. So we're, whether we're working remotely, as most of us are, or some of us are going back to the office, it's back to back meetings and we can end up really just pushing and working and if we stop for lunch, we don't really stop for lunch. We're still distracted. And in the afternoon, our energy drops. So we look for a snack and then come the evening when we finally relax, we end up perhaps eating more than we need because we're so famished. And maybe there's wine and chocolate that bookends that. Now, I'm not sure if any of this resonates with you. If it doesn't, I'd love to hear about what your strategy is that's working for you. If it does, the issue with this is the impact that this will have on your blood sugar, your blood glucose levels. 
which is where your energy starts as a foundation physically mentally and emotionally so you'll have lots of variation and we want to try and stabilize that if you want to own the title ceo and for me that means chief energy officer if you are your own chief energy officer you can mobilize energy on demand that is a really valuable asset to have now the more i do this work the more i realize there's no one size fits all generally what we see in the research and from my experience what i'm about to share with you works for most of us but not for everybody the point is to find the right blueprint for you and i'm going to share with you how you can find that out and then to make sure that you can put it into practice so consistency is much more important than intensity rather find a consistent approach to the way that you eat and exercise than be intense and then like do it for maybe two or three weeks and then stop and then start and generally what's this what seems to work well for most is the idea of combining protein and fiber so if you choose to have breakfast you may choose not to if you're doing intermittent fasting i know that many of us are doing that it helped me in lockdown when i was uh, eating far too much carrot cake <laughs> and to have strategic snacks on hand that once again combine protein and fiber and if you're not sure about what protein is and fiber i can always share with you some food lists and some recipe ideas but can you already notice how, how much more colorful this slide looks than the one before? There's a, a very important secret there. And then in the afternoon, if you're feeling tired, to ask yourself three things. Am I well hydrated? Most of us, are, especially now when it's this warm, the minimum that we should be having is, I'm gonna pop this into the chat, one glass of water per 10 kilograms that we weigh, and a glass is about 250 mils. So that's a baseline, that's over and above regular coffee and tea because those tend to be a diuretic. So if you think of your day to day, have you had a glass of water for every 10 kilograms that you weigh? And chances are there needs to be water around wherever you are now, because if it's not in sight, it may not be in mind. And this is a quick win in terms of boosting energy. I know when I don't drink enough water, I get a headache and I can feel tired and I can feel hungry, but it's a false trigger to eat. It's just because my mouth is dry. Another reason why our energy could drop in the afternoon is because we don't move around enough and we don't breathe correctly. So that's why I started off with the breath. Oxygen is one of also like water, a quick win in terms of keeping us energized and helping us optimize our mental, emotional and physical well-being. But so too does movement. And a lot of us sit when we're behind screens and doing the kind of work that we do. Sitting is the new smoking. Um, so I'll share some ideas of how you can activate if you aren't already doing that during your work day so it's great i know somebody shared that you're looking forward to your exercise session later but it's important to move in the day and i'm going to share with you the impact that that has on your brain as well so hydration oxygen movement and nature are you spending enough time in nature it's wonderful now with the longer days uh, but in the colder darker months we've got to be very careful about that nature is a food group and if you can't get out to nature to maybe harness it through even listening to natural sounds. I sometimes do that in the depth of winter, uh, play birds chirping or water or things, things like that. When you have a strategy like this that you follow, you're more likely to, at the end of the day, when you start relaxing, not have that bounce back where you feel like you need to maybe over drink or have sugar cravings or eat too much. The key though, as a dietitian, I've seen to making this happen is to set your environment up for success. So to shop for the right ingredients and keep them at home, or if you're going to be doing a hybrid version of work, working at the office and for your commute, and then to remember to stop and actually use them to refuel. And as part of your refueling strategy, to make it really colorful. So I always say, and have said for many years, that we should all eat like an artist. That means your plate should be a canvas for color. And by color, I don't mean wine gums or M&Ms. I mean nature's natural colorful foods. And the minimum we should be striving for are five tennis ball portions a day. A lot of the research, and for me and my family, we have cancer and Alzheimer's. So I try and have about double that amount because I know what the benefits are in terms of my genetics and also for my gut. For those of you that are already eating really well, perhaps you do eat colorful foods at most of your meals and you're easily reaching the quota. My question to you is, are you eating the full spectrum of color? 
so red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet, because the different colorful foods, colorful pigments, give you different bioactive compounds. So if you would like the slide that I'm showing you now, just respond to my thank you notes and I'll send it to you. It's, it's a bit of a shopping list that's got some rain, rainbow foods. And I always say once you have a why, you'll find a how. So why is eating like an artist important or having a lot of fiber in our diet? One of the keys is that it feeds the gut. And inside the gut, we've got this microbiome, this uh, universe of bacteria, which is where your immune system comes from and starts. So when we speak about COVID, a big part of that puzzle, a big piece is keeping our immune system strong from the inside. And we know that gut health plays an, an, an enormous role in that. I'm gonna share one personal story with you around how gut health can help a health condition. But there are hundreds more that I could share because it's a privilege and people share with me how they change their diets and how it benefits them. So I don't know each of you personally, but no matter what you might be experiencing from headaches to skin irritations to any form of inflammation, if you haven't already really looked at how you can help your gut to support that condition, I would recommend that you do that. So perhaps go see a nutritionist or a dietitian or do some reading on it. My mom in her early 20s, my parents are both French. If you get to know me, you'll know that I love Champagne. My family are from the Champagne region in France. They went to South Africa on honeymoon 53 years ago and they're still there. Not on honeymoon though. Uh, so I was born in South Africa, which is why I don't sound French. But in, in her early 20s, after arriving in South Africa, my mom went through a very stressful time and it activated a skin condition, a severe form of psoriasis. And every time she went through stress, her gut would go a bit weird, she'd have really bad constipation, and then her skin would flare, flare up. And she went through a very particular hard time where you can see in the picture, for the first time, it really affected um, the skin on her face and in her hair. She was in pain and she could not take any more of the corticosteroid med medication. So she saw a doctor that asked her questions about her gut for the first time in the context of her skin. And they picked up that actually she wasn't maybe eating enough fiber and needed to maybe put in some probiotics to rectify her gut microbiome. And within, it was less than five months, my mom's skin cleared phenomenally well. She has not taken any corticosteroid treatment since then. It's been five years. And as long as she eats those colorful foods, so she aims to have more than five servings a day, and occasionally she takes a probiotic, she keeps her skin clear. So last year, uh, I wasn't able to see my parents, as you well imagine. I'm sure you also haven't seen many of your loved ones. So on her birthday, I organized flowers to be delivered and they were delivered while I was on the phone to her. We were having coffee in the morning. You can see she's having a croissant, which is not a very colorful breakfast, but that highlights the 80-20 principle. 80% 80 of the time, if you do what's right for your body, then when you don't, the other 20% of the time, your body's resilient. It can still give you great results. So that was last year and uh, yesterday, <laughs> another birthday, not seeing my parents, talk about holding polarity, I arranged for more flowers and I got another photo. She was upset though because she didn't have any makeup on because it was a surprise. And I'm like, that's not the point, you don't need makeup and your skin looks amazing. So six years on and she's still managing it. So that's just one story of how when you look after your gut, it's phenomenal how it can support your entire system. But that means you've got to get it onto your plate. So I don't know about you, but remote working and living has made it easier for me because I generally, I was on the road all the time and it's a little harder and more challenging when you're traveling to always eat well. So are you eating colorful foods at all your meals? And if you need inspiration, I don't know if you live alone or you don't know how to cook or the kitchen doesn't really excite you. There are many resources out there. One that I can support you with is on my website. Every week I send out a simple recipe, five ingredients or less, because I'm not a chef, but it, that could be a way for me to remind you about your well-being and for you to maybe get some in inspiration. So we've taken a look at four points on the Wellculator so far. Strategic refueling, eating like an artist, uh, hydrating, how you eat is important. I mentioned how we can really rush through lunches. And then we can end up having what I call snack sedents or snack amnesia. So we end up more than we, we eat more than we need. We maybe don't chew properly. So digestion doesn't happen as efficiently. So how we eat is very important. 
Before I move on, I'd like you to take a moment to reflect. If you think of your own refueling and hydration strategy, celebrate what's going well because feeling good is important. We change most when we feel good anyway, not bad. So what's going well? And what's maybe percolated to the surface about what could be improved? And maybe um, if you aren't lying in the hammock and you've got pen and paper, you can write that down or just make a mental note to yourself if something has come up. And how do you know that you're following the right strategy? And I feel it's important now because we've got access to these tests. We can look at our health numbers. So are you measuring your health numbers? There's so much that you can easily test in the comfort of your home. So there's organizations and some of you might be using them. I'll pop it into the chat. Uh, Thriver is one. I use Forth for Life. And there's a few others where you can order sample kits that come to your home and you do a pinprick and then you can check things like cholesterol, which is I spelled that wrong, but cholesterol is important to, to check and blood glucose. Those two are important because they give you an indication of your risk for potentially stroke or cardiovascular disease or cardiovascular disease or diabetes. And then if you have any history of high blood pressure or heart disease in your family, definitely check blood pressure. Those three are basic ones that we should all keep track of no matter what our age once a year. And the more stressed we are, the more likely they are to change potentially. Then over and above that, you can check things, especially if you're taking supplements. So if any, any of you are taking things like magnesium and essential fatty acids, or maybe vitamin D, because we heard about the hype about how important vitamin D is. However, if you're like me, I took a vitamin D for a year and I was not absorbing it because genetically I don't have, there's a certain receptor defect. So I don't absorb it. So I had to change the type from a powder based tablet to an oil. And now I'm absorbing it. But I wouldn't have known that if I didn't check my vitamin D status and I would be wasting money. So if you are taking supplements, I recommend that you measure if they're working. And another form of test is where you can look at your at your DNA. So DNA Life, for instance, are a wonderful local provider that can give you insight into what supplements are probably better for you, what foods, what type of exercise and more insights. If you do, though, invest in that kind of test, I would highly recommend instead of just getting um, here's one of my reports because I've done five of these tests, 17 pages back to back. I'm motivated and committed, right? But I'm different. I'm biased. This is my, my passion. Don't pay for the test and, or the report and then don't go through it. So I would definitely uh, see somebody who will hold you accountable and say, OK, based on these findings, here are three or four or five things that you could do differently. But it's wonderful to know that we've got access to these. Like we, we don't have to wait to go see our GP. We can actually be a little bit proactive about our own well-being um, and then make sure that we're not wasting money if we're using supplements, for instance. Another important number that will affect all your other health numbers is the amount of hours of sleep that you get. How many hours of, of rest, of deep sleep did you get last night? Pop that into the chat. Some of you that have health trackers may know exactly. Otherwise, you might just guess. Wow, what, what a range already. So we've got eight, we've got two, we've got nine, seven, 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 seven. I like that. Enough. Good. I'm glad that you know what enough is. All right. There is a brilliant TED Talk, if you have not watched it, um, by Matthew Walker, who's the author of Why We Sleep, and it's called Sleep as Your Superpower. If you haven't watched it, uh, I would recommend that you watch it. And if you have, maybe watch it again. I've watched it four times and each time I'm like, right, because I'm a recovering insomniac. I, I, I really am a light sleeper. So um, very, I'm not going to go through why sleep is good for us. The one reason why it's importantly good for us is it helps to regulate emotions. And at the moment, we need to regulate our emotions uh, because of the context that we find ourselves in. However, sleep is not just about what happens in those four hours or nine hours when you're lying in bed and your head's on the pillow. It's all about how you approach the whole topic of rest and self care. Because now more than ever, I cannot believe how much burnout I'm seeing. I mean, I'm doing workshops on the topic. I'm doing one again tomorrow. I've got personal clients that are really exhausted. And that's potentially related to the fact that 
when we first get exposed to a stressor like we did 15 months ago, we can live off adrenaline. But if you don't start replenishing adrenaline with healthy behaviors and restoring balance back to the nervous system, you can get to a point of what we call surge depletion, where your body gets exhausted and you, yeah, you could actually move towards adrenal fatigue, which is a very serious condition. So I mentioned that nature is an important food group, so to speak. And nature reminds us about the seasons. I started with that quote about finding an invincible summer, even in the depth of winter. And now we know we can feel the summer. So if we take the seasons and we use this as an analogy for a 24 hour day, spring is the start of your day. As you wake up and you become conscious, so you come out of a, a delta theta brainwave and you realize that you're awake and it's a Wednesday morning. Spring ends and summer starts the moment you start engaging with work or WhatsApps or social media or news or anything that might trigger you into the stress response. So you might put on the telly and you don't know what you're going to see or read or be exposed to. And that could potentially cause you to start producing adrenaline and maybe cortisol and lift your blood pressure. So that's when you go into summer. Then summer ends when you choose to wind down. So hopefully soon after this presentation ends, or maybe this is part of your wind down. I know we're still busy on tech, but uh, we're talking about something really important and we need to wind down. Uh, before we get into bed and want to fall asleep again, which for me is the winter. That's the hibernation. So let's reflect on these four seasons. And I'd like you to think about which one could you potentially tweak so that maybe you incorporate the concept of rest and recovery so that it can help you get a deeper, more restful night's sleep. How long was your spring this morning? So from when you became conscious to when you reached for your phone or you were in front of your laptop, if that was your first engagement with the outside world. Are you happy to share that in the chat? I'm curious how many minutes or hours, depending. Two hours, there we go. 30 seconds, less than a minute. Uh, Adam, 93 to four minutes, him is two hours. Oh, what a range. Seems to be either like close to two hours or like less than two minutes in a minute okay okay wonderful okay those of you that are an hour or more please share your secrets with your colleagues like I'd like to know what you're doing are you walking the dogs how are you finding that time do you not have kids uh, I'm, I'm curious because that is great as long as the quality of what you're doing in that time is um, invigorating and restoring you if you are not able to do that and you're waking up with your phone as an alarm clock and reaching for it straight away um, the, the issue is that you don't know what you're going to be exposed to and you could then get pulled into the stress response quite quickly before you've even checked in with you. So the one thing that I have found a lot of um, peace in is poetry in lockdown, specifically David White. So he's an Irish poet. And one of the poems that he wrote is called What to Remember When Waking. And he describes this magical time so beautifully. In that first hardly noticed moment in which you wake, there is a small opening into the day. There is a small opening into the new day, which closes the moment you begin your plans. So the reason why this is important, and those of you that are not experiencing a long spring, summer will start and you will work really hard and you will expose yourself to extra adrenaline and, and potentially stress. So the longer you can keep yourself in that neutral state of when you wake up, and there's research now to show this, we can measure your response in terms of heart rate variability and cortisol. The longer you give yourself in the morning to stay in that balanced, rested state, because most of us wake up and that's when we're at our potential most balanced and calm, the more you could potentially benefit. So an exercise that may be something that you could explore doing, even if it starts while you're lying in bed in the morning and you just do this for two minutes or three minutes and then engage with your phone because you're used to picking your phone up straight away. Or maybe this is an exercise that you could do any time of day to bring you into the present moment. It's the 54321 exercise, which you may have come across. It's not one that I made up myself, but it's one that I use um, when I remember I need to set myself some nudges. So the concept is to 
tap into your five senses because when you're using your senses you're not in the future and you're not perhaps in the past you're in the present moment which is in itself a mindfulness practice so the idea is to notice five things that you can see uh, so perhaps look around you now I'm going to give you permission to give your eyes a bit of a break to look away from the screen and register five things that you can see around you ideally I'd like those five things to actually be things that make you feel happy or joyful so that's another resilience technique that we call joy spotting is to fill your environment with things that make you feel good and often when we're in our offices or even in our home office if you don't have five things around you that make you feel joyful maybe they, you could think about bringing some things in and then four things you can feel so perhaps Bring your awareness to your feet and notice how they're feeling either on the ground or on the chair or how your back or your 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 glutes are being supported by whatever you're sit sitting in notice the temperature around you i'm conscious that it's really warm in my room maybe reach out and touch something and just notice if it's hot or cold or smooth or soft <laughs> Guitars, lots of them. That's great, though. Put more in. I agree. I have flowers and books and um, playful little things like snow globes because I'm trying to be more playful. I take myself far too seriously. Then I'd like you to bring your awareness to your hen to your sense of hearing. You can hear my voice, but what can you hear much further than where you are? Potentially outside of the room that you're in. And if you're outside, wow! I imagine there must be some bird song at this time of day, or maybe some kids, or maybe a bit of traffic. When we go into the stress response, we can get very constricted physically, emotionally, and mentally. So bringing our senses outside of our peripersonal space can give us a sense of expansion. Ah, oh, and I'm not going to ask you to go and smell three things, but I am going to ask you to take two deep, nourishing breaths. So let's connect to our breath again. So breathing deeply into your belly, a little bit more deeper than what you were before. Thank you, I'm keeping an eye on the chat. I'm loving it, the different characters that are around. And as you exhale, relax your shoulders a little bit more towards the ground. Soften your jaw if you carry any tension in your jaw. Allow your tongue to drop to the bottom of your mouth. And then, if we refer to the sense of taste, perhaps if you're thirsty, have a sip of water. Uh, or allow the corners of your mouth to lift and bring a sense of smile and joy. I know it's not always easy to smile. It's quite incredible when we tap into our senses how ordinary things can start to look extraordinary there's a lovely quote by w bates the world is full of magical things patiently waiting for our senses to grow sharper and this has been proven by science so at harvard sean acor who's the author of the happiness advantage has measured that when people look out for things that make them feel happy or grateful they can shift towards being more optimistic so that is a real win. We just need to practice it because we won't, this doesn't always come naturally to all of us. We need to practice it. And before we know it, we're going to get pulled into our summer day, uh, which is our working hard output. We don't know what's going to come at us. And what's fascinating is this research from Microsoft showing what happens if you don't take breaks between your back to back meetings. So you can see here in the top row, there's a brain scans and it's quite orange and yellow. And what they were measuring was the beta brainwave activity, which is the brainwaves we go into when we're quite uh, stressed or concentrating and having to really pay attention. And when we don't take breaks, what happens is the stress accumulates. So over time, it started increasing and there were spikes between the transitions between meetings. So the fact that so many of us here today, perhaps we can come, I mean, there's 60 of us, 60 plus me. Can we always try to finish a meeting two minutes early? And as a minimum to give us an opportunity to grab some water to take a breath before we engage with the next meet meeting because when you do that as you can see by the brain scans we have more cooler calming tones and the beta brainwave activity or the stress did not accumulate there were opportunities for resetting when there were breaks in between the meetings so how can you take breaks as a minimum to keep your battery full because your battery will get depleted throughout the day i recommend the 20 20 20 guideline which is every 20 minutes look 20 feet away from your screen so just look far away for 20 seconds 
I don't know if anybody else has noticed that their eyesight has deteriorated, or is that just me? Because over the past year, all the screen time has definitely impacted my eyes. So I'm actively trying to do this, to take more breaks and to look far out. Um, it's not always easy, because as a presenter, I don't even look at myself or the cameras. I often stare into the camera itself, which is just a little light, so that you feel like I'm looking into your eyes. But try that. Def definitely take a break. And then if you can, even if you can't step away from your screen, but every hour, stand up and stretch and move and shift your posture because motion can shift your emotion and help you to also become aware of your breath and whether there's been tightness and some stress accumulating in your muscles. And please give yourself the gift of a 20 minute lunch break. Pretend that you're French or Italian, maybe not Spanish, they push it a bit, but like take a break. And don't be on your phone and devices and keep answering emails. Savor your meal or savor a glass of water or a cup of tea. Try it for a week or two and notice if your energy is any different in the afternoon. You may feel like you don't have the time, but you may actually be more productive so that you don't need as much time if you do that. And then at any time, even in the middle of a meeting, like right now, you can always tap into your senses. Uh, so you can tap into sight and hearing to stay present in the moment. Uh, and try not to multitask. I know this is hard and we've got notifications coming at us and so much to do. But uh, when we do that, we have what we call dual task interference and we end up taking longer to do things. Thank you for the share, Jenny, about how you, you're actively trying to manage meetings. When I work with business leaders, I speak about how we have to change meeting culture. And there's no reason why we need our meetings. We could make them 50 minutes. Um, just in order to help with the sense of getting breaks. And breaks are important. So sorry, I don't have a guitar in the picture and I have a violin, <laughs> but you'll know music only sounds like music because of the gaps in between the notes. If there weren't gaps and pauses, it would just sound like a loud, co loud cacophony of noise. And when we give ourselves permission to pause in the day, it makes it easier for us to start transitioning at the end of the day and to winding down. And this takes courage, right? Because to wind down means that we need to have boundaries because there'll always be something to do, always. Um, as I mentioned, I'm from the Champagne region in France. And as you'll know, the French are very pedantic about Champagne and Champagne can only be Champagne if it's made with the grapes grown within that re region. So for you to stay effervescent and sparkling like Champagne, what are your boundaries? What are your yeses and nos? What are non-negotiables? Because if you don't state them, your calendar will, your clients will, your colleagues will, and they will then prioritize your well-being. So I know it's not easy, but we need to think about, especially if we're working from home, how we can transition like we used to. We used to leave the office, right? Switch off our laptops, maybe. Pack it away. Say goodbye to colleagues. Walk out the door. Drive or catch transport. Um, go past the grocery store on the way back home or the pub or the gym, uh, come through the front door, get greeted by the fur children and the rest of the family. There were lots of moments that told us that we were transitioning into another time. But like me, like, you know, you might be working sometimes off your kitchen table, dining room table, your home office, going back to your living room. So we need to think about how do we stop knowing that there's always an email to answer, a proposal to do, some coding to do, something to to work on and this is where we need to think about uh, bringing in playfulness and creativity so a lot of neuroscientists and psychologists um Brene brown there's many people who are writing more and researching about the benefits of play and creativity and art especially now when we have so much going on on an emotional le level so for me, I've been building jigsaw puzzles, which I never used to do, and experimenting with different forms of art. Even if I just do it for 10 or 15 minutes at the end of my day, it helps me feel like I'm transitioning. Uh, music has also been something that's been quite helpful to me, and long walks in nature without earpieces. So no podcasts, no input. We need to take a break from these devices and this constant stimulus. There is so much information to digest. There's a great documentary uh, called Social Dilemma. I'm sure some of you have seen it on Netflix. I'll pop that into the chat. Um, if you haven't, it's really eye-opening, Social Dilemma. 
which speaks about the addictive nature of these devices and the internet and how we need to take breaks. And by doing that, when we ease, when we apply the brakes and we ease into the garage, so to speak, and we're about to sleep, it makes it easier to actually stop. Otherwise, it feels like you're going at 90 miles an hour all day and you started super early because your spring was quite short and then you just want to stop. And that's why you can end up being really tired, but wired and lying awake or waking up in the middle of the night and that monkey in your mind like becomes a whole big circus. And you're not going to tap into mindfulness or breathing techniques or be able to rest at one o'clock in the morning if you haven't practiced it when the stakes are low. So we default to what we practice. So a little bit of reflection before we look at the last few points on the calculator. If you think about your 24 hour day and using the seasons as an analogy, spring, summer, autumn and winter. Is there something that you could say no to? So have a boundary around saying no. No is a full sentence. What, what could you do less of? Wow, that was a fast response, Darren. You were definitely thinking about that. <laughs> Going to an old style mobile. Um, I had somebody earlier today while I was on the call order an alarm clock online so that they don't need to use their cell phone as an alarm clock because you can buy those. <laughs> I love that when we take what we put into our head, connect it with our heart, find a why, and then use our hands to take action. Head, heart, and hand alignment. That's like true integrity. And if there's not something to say no of, no to, is there something you need more of? Do you need more playtime, more creativity, more uh, time in nature, more spring in the morning? What do you need to say yes to? Right, we've spoken about sleep. I've mentioned how mindfulness in the day can help you get rest. And even if it's as simply as remembering that you've got senses and you can tap into them. I mean, it's great if you start cultivating a mindfulness practice like meditation. I meditate, but I started many years ago uh, and I know how difficult it can be. And sometimes if you're feeling really anxious uh, or you have depression, meditation is not the good, th not the best thing. It can actually increase your sense of anxiety. So be sure to speak to somebody who knows what they're talking about and you find the right form of mindfulness or meditation for you and for the situation that you find yourself in. Then we've spoken about number eight already. Number eight relates to how you move during your work day. So if you're sitting and you've been sitting for a while, while I keep chatting, I invite you to stand and stretch uh, to maybe lift your legs up and move and when you can in the day do walking talking meetings move away from your screen um, we have to look at how we can move more uh, because if we don't we end up compromising our metabolism and our posture and we can perpetuate that sense of potentially stress and then we need to be doing intentional exercise so by intentional exercise i mean half an hour at least on most days of the week and do something that you enjoy so it could be walking that's really that's good enough it could be cycling it could be a sport it could be i used to do a lot of salsa dancing uh, that clearly hasn't happened for a long time i miss that enormously and it took me over a year to realize that i could actually still dance i could just dance on my own and then i discovered actually that there were salsa classes online so i got a little bit of the fix it's not quite the same What's important though is to find exercise that you enjoy. So if you enjoy the gym, great, but do something that, that you actually look forward to and then you can do it and then get the benefit of the endorphins. And remember not to compromise on stretching and flexibility. I'm, I work with a lot of people that are really fit, but they're not necessarily uh, flexible or, and then that help, and that can be detrimental to joints and, um, well, the older we get, we know that the more supple we are, the better it is. Right, number 10 on the calculator relates to what we've discussed is, do you know your response to stress and have you got techniques to manage it? So the photo on the screen is one that I took myself. Uh, the last time I was in South Africa, I was on a wine farm just outside of Cape Town. And you can see there at the end of each vine it, are roses. And you may know this already, but the roses are there. I mean, they look beautiful. 
but they are there as an alarm system. So they alert the vine manager to the fact that something could be wrong because there's a certain aphid or bud or bug that will affect the roses first before it impacts the rest of the vine. And of course, if the vine manager doesn't pay attention, the cost is enormous. You can lose the whole crop. What are your roses? What are your alarm bells? How do you know that you are potentially skirting into stress? And that if you leave unresolved, could get through, could deteriorate your immune system, your mental or emotional well-being, impact your lifestyle, the way that you feel mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually. And one of the tools, because there are many, but for today, the one that I shared with you is tapping into your breath. So being aware of your breath and slowing it down, breathing deeper and lengthening the exhale. Within a few breaths of doing that, you can tap into the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the rest and digest. Rest and digest. The clue is there. It helps your body feel like it's resting and you can properly digest your food and that supports your gut health, which is where your immunity is. So I invite you to take a deep breath and I'm now going to remind you what we've been through and I'm going to ask you to score yourself. Give yourself one point for every yes. So if you answer yes, I do that most of the time, 80% of the time. Um, give yourself a point, one point. And if you answer no, no point. And I'll trust you to negotiate half points with yourself. So the first thing we looked at is, do you have a strategy around the way that you refuel? So have you got a way that you eat 80% of the time that supports your energy and good health? Whether that's paleo or keto or Mediterranean low fat like I do or intermittent fasting, it's a strategy that you know works for you and you put it into place. Yes or no? One point for yes, no point for no. Are you eating colorful foods? Do you eat like an artist? Are you supporting good gut health? So a minimum of five servings, tennis ball portions, of those colorful foods on most days of the week and a variety of colors across a week. Are you a mindful eater? So most of your meals, do you eat undistracted and savoring the meal? And generally it takes 15 minutes for us to enjoy a meal and to not eat too quickly and to allow the message to go from the stomach to the brain to say that you've had enough to eat. Are you well hydrated? Are you drinking enough water? Do you check your basic health numbers? So as a basic, I would say cholesterol, blood pressure, and blood glucose. Are you checking those on an annual basis? So at least once during, since COVID happened, you've had them checked. Are you getting enough sleep? And that in itself was a vast topic because we spoke about spring, summer, autumn, winter, but generally, are you bringing in the concept of, let's say sleep for half a point, and are you bringing in micro recharging recovery pauses in your day? So like a mindful minute or 20 minute lunch or some of the guidelines that I, that I shared for the other half. Do you have some moment in your day where you are mindful? That could be a morning cup of tea or it could be a half an hour sit down meditation practice. But on most days you spend time in a state of mindfulness. Generally that means stillness and solitude. We're not, you know, digesting YouTube, let's say. Do you move around enough during the day? So are you conscious of sitting and standing and stretching and not sitting for long periods of time? Are you doing intentional exercise that you enjoy? So let's make this half and half. Half an hour most days of the week, you do either cardiovascular or weight bearing exercise half a point. You also include regular stretching. So some form of just basic morning or evening stretches, maybe Pilates, or you warm up and warm down, but stretching is part of your routine as well. And number 10, do you know when you're triggered into the stress response? Have you got your red flags, your roses? And do you have at least one strategy that you can put into place without having to go on a spa holiday, like the mindful breathing or the senses exercise? Right, I'd l I'm really curious, if you're happy to share in the chat, what is your score on the Wellculator today? Oh, we got started off with a great start, eight. 
five and a half, two and a half, six and a half, half. Thank you, everyone. One. One and a half with not a smiley face. That's cool. You've got loads of areas to improve on. That's amazing. Okay, what a range. <laughs> I sometimes say minus a point if you're a smoker. So some people end up having minus one. Um, excellent. Thank you, everyone, for sharing. As you type in your score, can you remember what your subjective check-in was when I asked you at the beginning? How would you score yourself? Because uh, that could be an interesting piece of awareness too. So no matter what your score is on the well calculator, uh, whether it's one or eight, an ideal score is to feel good, maybe 10 out of 10, to be doing most of these things most of the time. However, this is not rocket science, but it's not, the common knowledge is not common practice. So what I'd like you to do is pick one thing that intuitively in this moment, you feel actually I'd like to use that to increase my score by half or by one. And what will that one thing be? And that becomes your personal pledge. Because if we try and change too much at once, we end up setting ourselves up for failure. And I want you to feel good about doing this one thing. Because we know that when you feel good about something, that's when you're more likely to do it again. So what is your one thing? And if you're happy to make a public declaration, pop it into the chat. What has been an insight that stood out for you? Or what is your one thing, your personal pledge that you're going to commit to doing until we see each other again and we can do a check in then and either celebrate or maybe look at challenges and how we can build on that. Ah, stretching, but don't know how. You can look up something called the five Tibetan rites as a start. Anything you don't know how, you can ask me or ask Google. Ah, oh, move. I love these suggestions. There's quite a range. Yeah, Tai Chi is amazing. Um... Okay, and there's a variety from movement to food uh, to hydration. I will send the calculator as part of the thank you note as a one pager that you can print out maybe and keep as a reminder and a more comprehensive version if you'd like to go through it again, especially with a loved one, because the best way to integrate a learning is to always share it with others. And I can't begin to highlight how when you start with doing small things like this one pledge, this is what is your necessary next step then before you know it you look back and potentially you're doing the impossible like two years ago when i started doing cold showers i never would have thought that now i'm doing wild water swimming if you had said to me you'd be swimming in the cold waters in the uk i'd be never i, I could barely stand for 10 seconds under a cold shower but that's what happens when you start doing what's necessary what's possible you end up doing what seemingly seemed un impossible so that is wonderful i'm loving all the pledges uh, I am really delighted to be able to spend this time with you. I appreciate your attention. It's your most valuable resource. And I want to say thank you to Adrian and the rest of the team. I'm able to linger for a while if anybody wants to stay online and ask me any questions. And please look out for the follow up notes. Find me on social media if you want to get some inspiration. And please come and uh, when we communicate the check in, I'd love to see you then. Thank you. Thank everybody. you, Celine, so, 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 so much. It's been really useful. I'll, I'll get all of the follow up information out to everybody, so don't need to worry about, about that. But um, yeah, if I could just ask for people to show their appreciation with a wave or thumbs up, it's uh, really appreciated. So, did you say that you're happy to stay on for questions, Neil? Yeah. So, yeah, feel Absolutely. free, everybody, to take a fancy of that, or you might want to start thinking about your autumn and winter phase for the evening. It's up to you. And have a glass of water if you're going to have a G&T. 